All right, so today the skin, the integumentary system. We'll talk about its function, uh, different structures, a little bit on how it works. And we'll talk about the different conditions. All right, the integumentary system. What type of tissue is this? So we have four types of tissue. So is it epithelial? Is it nerves? Is it muscle? Or is it connective tissue? What type of tissue is skin? One, two, three, four. So it makes a border with our body. So that includes the skin, GI tract, and all of our glands. So we'll talk about the top portion, the middle portion, and what's underneath the skin. So the average person, about eight pounds, six to eight pounds, making it the largest. And then all the structures within the dermis are the accessory structures. Hair, nails, glands, uh, and even your pain and heat sensors. Right, functions. So first line is protection. So it keeps everything on the outside out and whatever's supposed to be on the inside in. And then UV protection with uh, our pigmentation as well. And we'll talk about the, the melanocytes and how we get our pigmentation. And our oil glands kind of condition the skin and it helps us from dehydrating as well. What's normal body temperature? Yeah, 98.6 or so. And we keep our body temperature through the skin in a couple ways. So there's hair, there's fat, but also the blood vessels. So if it's hot, blood vessels open to dissipate that heat. So it brings up the heat to the surface of the skin. That way it can escape. If it's too cold, the blood vessels close. So what happens to your fingers and toes when it gets really, really cold? They might go a little numb, right? That's because there's no more blood flow. And if that continues, you'll get frostbite. You'll literally freeze. Vitamin D. So this is why cholesterol is important. So cholesterol in your skin will react with UV light to create the precursors for vitamin D. So the precursors are made in your skin and then it goes to the liver for final production. So you do need some skin exposure, some sunlight exposure. So you can't absorb calcium unless there is vitamin D. So our milk that we drink from the grocery stores, they actually add vitamin D. Different types of receptors for pain, heat, cold, and even pressure. Top layer, epi. Epi means above. So above the dermis is the epidermis. Is there any blood supply? Is there any blood? You guys see any blood vessels? No, right? So that means these cells are going to get their nutrients just leaking from the lower la la layers. And if there's any toxins, then the toxins just leak out of your skin. The next layer, we got the dermis. This is where all the structures are, the accessory organs, hair, glands, and even your goosebump muscles. You guys know what that's called? That's the erector pili. We'll get to the names of these structures shortly. Hypo means below. So below the skin, we have the hypodermis, aka sub. Sub is also below. 
cutane is another way of saying skin so under the skin all this yellow stuff is fat and then below the fat what is there muscle so this pink part here is the muscle superficial so that's the top layer of skin. So the epidermis is the superficial layer. And they're going to divide it into two parts. Right? So the top layer is the stratum corneum. So strata just means what level it is. So that's the outermost layer. So just think of like corns on the feet. So they're the top layer of the feet. So it's mostly dead cells. And what makes them waterproof is the protein keratin so we'll have cells on that epidermis layer that will produce keratin to make your skin tough strong and also waterproof it's the same protein that makes your nails and hair but it's embedded in your skin cells the basal layer this is where they're dividing so remember they're growing and as they get pushed up they start to flatten out. So the top layer, those skins are very, very flat, so they cover a large surface area. Right? So as they grow up. The protein keratin is laid down by the cells, uh, keratinocytes. So these are the cells that produce the keratin. Melanocytes on the other side produces the protein melanin and this is what gives you your pigment so there's different colors of melanin right black brown red so your color or your um, complexion is not based on the number of melanocytes you have but how active they are so we all have the same number of cells that can produce pigment but some people their melanocytes make more other people it makes less the dermis so here is the second layer a little bit deeper more complex because remember that's where all the organs are the accessory organs of the skin we have sweat glands sodorific we'll talk about the two types uh, later on there's the stinky sweat and the watery sweat sebaceous that is oil these glands produce sebum so that oil conditions your hair and also conditions your skin the hair follicle so this is what produces the hair the hair shaft and hair is just modified skin it's grown that it's it's dividing at the root and it gets pushed out just like skin is and your goosebump muscle is the erector pili. What type of muscle is this? Your goosebump muscles. What type of muscle? There's only three choices. Is it skeletal, smooth, or cardiac? Smooth muscle. Why? Can you say make goosebumps and does your arm make goosebumps no so it's not under your control so it's not the heart so it, it has to be smooth muscle so very good as we age we lose connective tissue in our skin so that's why wrinkles develop and that's why our skin starts to sag so the two most important proteins in your skin are collagen and elastin so collagen is what fills up all the areas in your skin so the only reason you have wrinkles is you lose collagen right where the skin starts to fold in and elastin is just like the name it makes your skin like rubbery your skin will bounce back and of course blood supply no blood in the epidermis the dermis there is going to be blood vessels and you're going to have your nerves there as well 
subcutaneous, under the skin, a.k.a. hypodermis. Adipose is another word for fat. So if somebody says hypodermis, adipose, subcutaneous, they might use those terms synonymously. So the skin has tight connective tissue. Your fat, you're going to have more loose connective tissue. Skin color. So as mentioned, it's not the number of melanocytes, but it's the activity. So we need sunlight. So if you are at the equator, do you tend to be fair skin or dark skin? Do you get a lot of sunlight or no sunlight? How about if you're in the poles? Do you get a lot of sunlight or no sunlight? No sunlight? So less, right? It's cloudier. There's Arctic um, storm. So here people tend to be lighter in complexion because they need to absorb all the sun they get, all the UV they get. Whereas those on the equator are usually darker in complexion because they need to block off the harmful UV light. They get enough for their vitamin D needs. That's not always the case because the um, Inuit population, they're actually darker skin and it's their diet that determines their skin color because they get enough vitamin D from the foods they eat. It's a genetic trait, not one gene, but it's a combination of so if you ever seen like a, a litter of puppies or kittens, how you can get a full spectrum from pure white cats to a pure black cat and everywhere in between. Similar with how our genes express for a pigmentation. Hemoglobin, heme is blood, globin is just a protein. So this is a blood protein that carries oxygen. So we need iron in order to carry oxygen. Iron will attract the oxygen. So if you don't have enough oxygen, you can't make hemoglobin, you can't carry oxygen, you have bad red blood cells, so you always feel, what happens if you're anemic? You always feel cold. Cause, what's that? Yeah, you have it. Right? And that's because you can't carry oxygen. We need oxygen and sugar to make energy. So what color does that look? Hemoglobin plus oxygen, right? A reddish pink color. But if it's not, then you have this condition called cyanosis. So cyanosis just means, cyano means blue. So that means you're turning blue because of that lack of oxygen. Skin lesion. So I won't go through every single one, just, just a few of the common ones. Right. So a freckle, just a concentrated area of pigmentation. And it's normal unless it starts to change. And that's the most important thing. So have you guys ever heard of a mole check? No? Which patient population usually have to do a mole check? Young, adult, or the old? The young? more of the old so in nursing homes they actually will take photos of their freckles their birthmarks and then they'll compare it if it starts to change that's the most important thing it may be cancer so if you see a freckle or a mole or a birthmark starts to change go get it checked out primary so that's a direct cause so that disease is probably a skin disorder. Right? Secondary is from trauma. So you damage it physically. And then tertiary, that's if a different disease caused skin problems. Uh, vascular, so an example would be a bruise. Right? Have you guys heard of varicose veins? 
veins on your legs that pop out, right? So if you have varicose veins in your anus, those are called hemorrhoids, right? Same exact stuff, phenomena. Just where it's occurring in your body, they call them a little different things. Varicose veins on the legs, hemorrhoids in the anus. Now we'll talk a little bit, I won't go through all of them, but an ecchymosis, that is a bruise. So that is blood cell under the skin and they're dying so they'll start to discolor as the um, immune system takes them away. Uh, a fissure. So everybody go like this with their fists and you see how your skin kind of folds here. Uh, where your index finger and thumb is, right? So that's the same as your anus. So just imagine one of those cracks, those lines start to rip, right? Can you stop using your anus? No. So sometimes it'll be very hard to heal. Uh, let's see. So here we'll talk about Chia. So those are little, uh, it looks it looks like little pimple blisters, but it's actually bud vessels that are uh, expanding and emerging under the skin. Right? So little blisters. Uh, a wheel. So that's fluid under the skin. Have you guys been given the TB screening on your forearm. They usually do that for school once yeah. in a while. So that what need to uh, form after you give the injection. So when you give the injection, you should form a hive. If there's no hive, then that injection wasn't successful. Follicles. So this is the part of the skin that produces hair. So if you don't have follicles, then you don't produce hair. So for a lot of men, this hormone causes the death of hair follicles. So a lot of the drugs for men will block this hormone. And it's a testosterone derivative. And then for some of them, it does work. Their hair does grow back. For women, they usually don't get male pattern baldness. You guys see male pattern baldness, right? where you'll get those two things in on the temple and then you'll get this like uh, troll patch in the front, right? So that's the male pattern baldness. Now for women, do they get that pattern? Do they get the patch in the back of the head, the receding uh, hairline? So for women, they normally get thinning of the hair. Right? So those old ladies, what do they do with their hair? To make it look full again they get a big puffy fro right they make their hair curly so that's how they hide the thinning hair goosebump muscle what type of muscle is it again is it skeletal smooth or cardiac smooth right. so remember you can't control your goosebumps they work on their own so when you get cold, they kind of fluff up, try to keep in body heat. When you get scared, that muscle activates as well. All right, what type of glands are sodorific glands? Sweat, all right. So how many types are there? Two. So here is the watery stuff. So little kids, you know, five, six years old, most of the time they run around, they get sweaty. Do they stink? Not really. Not, not if you let them run around for a couple days. But once you turn about 12, 13 years old, they took a shower, a bath in the morning. By afternoon, what happens? They start stinking, right? Because these glands will develop. So in your groin region, underarm, uh, they'll start producing a thicker, and uh, more nutritious 
secretion and it's the bacteria that feast on the secretions that give off the odor right so it's not their fault it's the bacteria that's eating so you get rid of the bacteria you get rid of the smell or you use antiperspirant or deodorant to block or get rid of the of sweat and then sebaceous is the oil glands how often should you shampoo Every day, every other day, once a week. So when you shampoo, you strip your hair of the natural oils that condition it. So after you shampoo, you should put those oils back in, right? So that's why you use shampoo and then conditioner, right? So now you guys know why you use both? Okay. Nails. So the nail needs the nail root to grow. So as long as you have the nail root, the nail will grow back. Slam your fingers in a car door, the nail might fall off, but as long as you have the nail root, it'll come back. It might not come back pretty the first time, but eventually you'll get it back. So this white area, there's no blood supply there, so that's the lunula. And then everywhere else where there's blood, that's your nail bed. What are your nails made out of? What makes the skin waterproof? What's your hair made out of? Uh-oh, it's all the same stuff. Keratin. The protein is keratin. Make sure you make sure you write that down. So your keratinocytes produce keratin in those cells. Hair, skin, and nails. All right, skin healing. So skin healing, any healing is part of your immune response. So you get redness and dilation. So this means blood is going to rush in. So that might bring in heat. And it might bring in fluids, right? So that's going to tell your body, hey, there's something wrong. Uh, it might cause swelling, which you can't use that part of the body anymore. So that's your immune system signal saying, hey, there's something wrong. Stop using that part of the body. What causes pain? The excess fluid pushing on the pain receptors. So those are the free nerve endings that are your pain receptors. You get inflammation. There's a hormone called prostaglatin. It's a paracrine hormone. That causes all these things to happen. Blood rushing in, dilating. Injury occurs, blood clot forms. So many steps in order for a blood clot to form. And then uh, what happens is your platelets become sticky and they become fibrous and it traps in blood cells. So all those blood cells dying, getting trapped within those sticky platelets produces your scab. So that covers the wound and it allows the skin underneath to replace uh, the damaged areas. Burns. So we got first degree, second degree, third degree. Which one do you think is the most painful? First degree, second degree, or third degree? You don't have to answer now. Just think about it. So rule of nine. So if I do 11 times nine, what do I get? What's 11 times nine? That's 99, right? So 1%, that's for your groin area, your genitals. So you got 11 body parts. That's about... 9% each. And the reason they use the rule of 9 is at about 9% of your body being burned, we start to get complications. So it's harder to successfully treat them and keep them stable. So let's go over the 9 body parts because you'll need to determine or estimate approximately what percentage of a victim's body is burned. Alright, so let's keep count. The head. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then your genital, right? So the head is nine percent. So if it's just the front of a head, that's four point five. If it's the back of the head and neck, four point five. So the whole head, the whole surface area is nine. So let's do an arm. All right, so right arm, left arm. So that means the whole arm, front and back, is 9%. So just the front of the arm is 9. If it's just the back of the arm, it's 9. If it's from the elbow down, how much would that be? Half the arm, so that's 4.5. If it's from the elbows to the shoulder, how much would that be? 4.5, because the whole arm is 9. So if it's just half the arm, then it's half the amount. So the whole right arm is 9, the whole left arm is 9. All right, let's go to the leg. So, so right leg front is 9%. Right leg back is 9%. So if we do left leg front and left leg back, then that's also 9%. So here, the entire front of one leg is 9. The whole leg, front and back, is 18. How much is it if somebody dipped their foot in to boiling oil? How much did they get burned? Up to their knee. What percentage of their body is that? So the whole leg is 18. So this would be half their legs. That would be 9%. So you'd approximate 9%. That's going to be a serious injury. So the whole leg is 18. The front is half of that 9. The back is 9. So if it's just the thigh area, the whole thigh, front and back, that would be 9. All right, now let's get to the torso. So this is going to be the front of the body. Just remember that's 18%. Right, so this whole area is 18. And then the back. That's 18. So the whole back. So you got to be careful on the way they describe the body. And then lastly, and that's for your genital region. And that's only 1%. Burns. So if it's superficial... That's first degree. If it's partial, it's going to burn some of the dermis. And if it's full thickness, then it's going to go all the way down to the underlying structure. Skin will appear barbecued. That's third degree. Let's go to the image. So don't put anything on a burn. And don't remove anything. They'll do that at the hospital. So they used to put things like butter. And the only reason because it might have been in the fridge and it was something that's cold at the time. But all you want to do is use cool water. To be not cold. You don't want to use cold water. You want to use cool water. So cool water. Avoid cold. Uh, you can cover it. Um, if it's like a second, first, second degree burn, it might blister afterwards. You have to tell the patient try not to pop those blisters. Check for airway so they don't close. The patient might go into anaphylaxis. It's best to put an airway in before the airway starts to close. So the faster you get to the hospital or the ambulance come they can put that tube in before they swell up <laughs> cancer so your skin damage accumulates so why is UV bad what does UV do in your body it directly damages DNA and as you guys know, DNA code for RNA, 
which codes for everything in your body. So if you damage the instructions, you might get damaged products. And that can also turn on a cancer gene. We all have cancer genes in our body. It's just that they're suppressed. They're not turned on. Basal, squeamish, those are going to be the most common. The most deadly, melanoma. So that means that mole check, remember, I was talking about? Kind of applies if cancer runs in the family or if you're exposed to a lot of sunlight. There used to be a lot of tanning beds, tanning places. Not so much anymore. All right, basal cell. So this is where the cells are dividing. So it's not the top surface. It's just a little bit deeper in the epidermis. So here's what it looks like. Not too bad. Uh, we can cut it off. So this is like using a razor blade. And we can just take thin layers of it until we remove it. We can electrocute it. So electrodesiccation. Is to dry it out using a uh, electric current. Uh, we can do Cairo. So Cairo means cold. So we can freeze them off. Squeamish. So this is the top layer. A little bit less common. So basal cell is going to be the most common. The second most common would be squamish cell. But this is the top layer of skin. A lot of times people will mistake it like a scar, a bug bite, or even a pimple, um, but it's actually cancer. Um, these guys aren't so bad as long as you catch them early and they're localized. You can just remove them, freeze them off, um, but if they spread, that's when they become dangerous. Do you guys know who Bob Marley is? How'd he die? Yeah, skin cancer in his toe. Here's the bad one. Here's the deadly one. So the mole check happens. Let's use the A, B, C, D, E rule. So you can identify if it might be malignant. So malignant is just another way of saying cancer. What's a tumor then? Tumors uncontrolled growth. It's usually local, not really damaging nearby structures. But once it's able to move about, then it's malignant. It can metastasize, invade other areas of the body. Surgery, chemo, so we'll have to follow up with some drugs if a piece breaks off and then goes into another part of the body. Uh, cancer, your immune system can actually fight cancer. So what they do here is they'll take your T cells, so that's one of your white blood cells, and they'll grow them outside your body, and they'll put them back in your body, and then your own immune system can actually fight off the cancer. So at some point, your body is winning the battle, but cancer just takes over. A, hey, asymmetrical. So that means it doesn't look the same. Borders, it could be bumpy, it could be raised, and irregular. C is for color. If it changes color, um, mix of a bunch of different colors. D is diameter, larger than a pencil eraser. So not that big. And then change, so the most important thing evolving if it changes color changes size changes position that's why we have to take photos so if you're working in geriatrics just be prepared you might have to check out the camera take pictures of patients skin uh, their moles and their wounds sometimes you have to document the progression of a wound healing as well cancer stages so remember 
most successful is early detection. So if it's only in the top layer of skin and hasn't spread, quick surgery, quick removal, and, um, and that's pretty much it. Just come back, we'll check to see if any more areas pop up. Now if it goes a little bit deeper, then now we're in stage one. It is evaded nearby structures. Stage two, now it's entering deeper areas. Stage three, and this is for all cancers, is now it enters the lymph nodes. Have you guys heard of the lymphatic system? You guys heard of lymph nodes, right? So the lymphatic system filters the fluids in your body. And when it goes past the lymph node, that's your checkpoint. Your lymph node filters out that fluid, making sure there's no bacteria or anything that can harm you. So if it enters into the lymph fluid, it's pretty much going to go through every part of your body. So now it can spread. Once it's at stage four, it's pretty much everywhere in your body. So it probably has entered the bloodstream. And if it does, it can then colonize any area of your body. Really hard to treat somebody who is stage four. Who gets alopecia? Men or women? It's usually women, right? Thinning of the hair. Men usually get matter, male pattern baldness. Cellulitis. Here we have inflammation, and it's usually where the hair is. Um, who gets eczema? Young, young adult, or the old? Young. What causes it? So it's an autoimmune disease. So the body's immune system is attacking its own skin cells for some reason. So some things will trigger it. Uh, they say if you reduce certain foods, it might help. Eczema? Uh, it's not contagious, but it can be uh, life altering. I mean, imagine if it's on your face and your young kid. Imagine if it's on like 50% of your body and it's super itchy and it's oozing blood. Right? Hair follicles getting infected. Right? Swimmer's rash. Uh, herpes simplex 1. Oral. Herpes simplex 2. Genital. But the virus doesn't care. If you can uh, infect a skin cell, it'll infect a skin cell. So what do they call herpes? The gift that keeps on giving. Because once you have a virus, it's always in your body. Even though you don't have any sores or active uh, viral activity, you can still spread herpes. Chickenpox is herpes zoysters. So the chickenpox is a type of herpes. Uh, cold sores, type of herpes. Fever blisters, herpes, HPV, yeah, we can put that in the herpes family as well. Impetigo is an infection, very contagious. Make sure you have your personal protective equipment. Right? If you're in contact with the patient, gloves, mask, gown. If you see a uh, an RO outside a patient's door. That stands for resistant organism. So that's a super bug that they're infected with. Don't even don't even open the door. Uh, head lice. So cap means it's on your head. Corpus means it's on your body. Pubis, it's in your pubic region. So here you're you don't have an infection when it's multicellular. This is called an infestation. So you have a lice infestation or pubic lice infestation. Psoriasis. Who gets psoriasis? Young, young adult, or the old? Yeah, it's usually young kids will get eczema. Once you get a little older, teen, you'll tend to develop psoriasis. Similar to eczema, 
it's an autoimmune condition where your immune system starts attacking your healthy skin cells for no apparent reason. Additionally, same certain foods, certain behaviors like stress will trigger psoriasis. And the treatment similar. We suppress your body's immune system. Ringworm. Is it a worm? It's a fungus. Right? So if it occurs on your body, then it's tinea corpus, because a corpse means body. If it's capus, that means it's on your head. And if it's heads, that's on your feet. So you have athlete's foot. And um, if it's on the body or head, they call it ringworm because fungus can only eat dead things. They're decomposers. So if you go to the gym, don't wear flip-flops. Somebody didn't wipe off the equipment. You use somebody's towel. You get that fungus on your skin, it eats the dead skin. So it can't eat any deeper, so it has to move outwards and eat the next layer of dead skin. Once it eats that layer of dead skin, it continues to grow outwards giving that ring pattern. Rosacea. Um, kind of look like um, little blisters as well. Can look like uh, little pimples, but it's blood vessels dilating. We use laser treatment sometimes to just zap those, those blood vessels away. Scabies. Are you infected or is there an infestation? Infestation. Infestation. Because it's multicellular. If it's single cellular, infected. Multicellular, infestation. So it's going to look like little pimples because these guys, they've dug their head inside you. Right? So now you get this little blister that forms, but they're actually embedding themselves in your skin. Easy to treat, just put on an overnight shampoo, wear some clothes head to toe, and then take a shower the next day, and hopefully it eradicated all the mites. What's a wart? A tuma. So the virus attacks the cell, disrupts DNA, and that causes a tumor. And what can a tumor lead to? Cancer. So in the case of HPV, human papillomavirus, right, it causes little papules, right, papilloma, papules, that are tumors, and that can lead to cervical cancer. Hence um, the popularity of the Gargisil shot, Gargisil vaccine. All right, that ends the integumentary system. I believe today's online learning initiative is modules 21 and 22, I believe.